I then invite you to open your Bibles, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians. And uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is a, is a uh, brand new letter that we're going to be looking at. So today is somewhat of an introduction uh, as we're, as we're going to go into that. And I've titled it Another in the sense, well, here's another letter from the Apostle Paul. But uh, you notice my subtitle? Beans or ice cream? And uh, as, I, as, I, as I grew up, I think I ate more beans than I should have. <laughs> more green beans. As I'm thinking about, uh, I think I, my, the evening staple at our house, I think, was, uh, was meat and taters and beans. I think that was kind of the, the main thing. Now, once in a while, we probably had some corn or some other things, you know, but it seems like to me beans grow easy and the kids and us kids could snap them pretty easily and uh, they canned up pretty nice. And uh, I'm, glad that, I'm glad today that I don't dislike the beans. I, I still enjoy beans, but I think there were a time, there was probably a time or two growing up where I thought, I don't want to see another bean on my plate. You know, I probably felt that way. On the other hand, I love Dairy Queen. Now, uh, of course, I did not, I had to make this cone, of course, genuine cone under here, but uh, sitting up here in this heat, you, you know what kind of a mess we'd have. But on the other hand, I, 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 like, I like ice cream. And uh, how, how much was a, a decent cone at Dairy Queen back uh, 30 years ago? Yeah, you remember five cents? Yeah, five, ten cents, you know, fifteen cents, and then you could get you could get a really big one for a quarter when I was a kid. I mean, it was it was a lot, you know, and uh, so I, I enjoyed that. In fact, in but uh, in fact, uh, I enjoyed it so much. Uh, I, I, probably one of the reasons I enjoyed it. I think the closest soft serve machine to us in northern Minnesota was at least twenty five miles away. So we didn't have the treat of Dairy Queen very well, but I remember one time going to my grandparents. Both my grandparents lived in the same town, and uh, they had a Dairy Queen in town. And I remember uh, then grandparents knew that we loved Dairy Queen, and I remember my, I remember my, uh, my brother and I were there by ourselves, and we had dinner with one grandparent, and they took us to Dairy Queen for dessert. Ah, boy, that was good. And then the other grandparent came to get us to spend the night. And wouldn't you know, we drive by Dairy Queen on the way, on the way by. And uh, I remember, and they said, how do you guys like a Dairy Queen? I remember my brother starting to say, we all, and I think I elbowed him. And I, you know, I wouldn't want to have robbed my grandparents of the joy of giving their grandchildren a Dairy Queen, would you? Anyway, so we had two DQs that night. That was pretty... I don't know why I remember that, but uh, I, th I think I kind of felt a little guilty, but, uh, but you know how it goes. Well, as, as, Paul, as Paul wrote this letter, it's another letter from Paul in a short period of time to the Thessalonians. So it was another one. And, you know, I suppose some of them could have looked at it like beans. Some could have looked at it like, oh, another... And especially if they had fallen for the, the letter that came in between these letters that was a hoax. In chapter 2, Paul writes about that some, there may have been a letter that someone signed his name to. And so these people might have said, oh, another letter from Paul. Wow, well, he just wrote us a letter and it was all goofy, you know, whatever it was. But anyway, other people, I think, though, the genuine believers would have looked at it as ice cream. I think they'd have looked at it in a positive way and looked at it with, the, uh, with relish. They'd have looked at it with desire and they thought, wow, another letter from Paul? And so let's let you and I get a taste of, of the introduction. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm going to read the first four verses. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations which you, that you endure. <clears throat> 
And so we're going to just cover those verses this morning and just look at the content of this letter to, to let them to get a taste, get a feel for what, what Paul was writing as he, as he began this letter. And it, the, of course, as we begin this, there, Paul brings, brings his own name. Well, as he brings out his own name, it has to do with relationship. One of the things we noted as we went through 1 Thessalonians is that Paul had this intimate relationship with these people. And so as he's writing to them, as is the custom of the day, he puts his name first. Here's the, here's the author of the letter. However, I, I don't think Paul is appealing to them so much on the basis of this relationship. He's appealing to them on the authority as God's apostle. And I notice in our Christian world today that most Christians don't recognize Paul's significance as the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed. I, I can turn on the radio. I could read a book or an article. Most don't recognize the significance of the Apostle Paul's ministry. They don't recognize him as the revealer of the dispensation of the grace of God. And you see on the, on the board here, I've laid out the, the dispensations for you and, and the blue being Paul there. Paul is the one to whom God revealed the dispensation of grace as he revealed the law to Mo, to the law to Moses. But when we look at when we look at Paul's other credentials, he's the writer of 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Basically half of the New Testament, here's the apostle Paul, the predominant writer. The predominant writer probably in the whole Bible, but but as we look at Paul's significance, we ought not miss it. And so as Paul writes to these guys, he's writing to them not just as another of the dozen apostles, he's writing to them as the apostle of the, the church, the body of Christ. Now, even if people don't recognize Paul as, as the apostle of the body of Christ, he is their apostle if they're truly trusting Jesus Christ. No matter what church name you hang on the door or whatever, but Paul is the apostle of the body of Christ. That means he's our apostles. And that's something that I, that I want to emphasize today and just thinking about Paul, he's our apostle. He laid the foundation for, for this church in Thessalonica. He laid, that, he laid that foundation in person with them. He is the one who, he, who suffered for doing so. We're going to look at that in a moment. He's the one that revealed revealed God's truth about what the church really is. And so I'm actually saying here that there is no revelation, there is no truth about the church, the body of Christ, in any other letters in the New Testament but Paul's. I know that's kind of a bold statement. But I want to have a shocking statement in a sense. I want to have a bold statement. In other words, you're, you're going to find other, play, other things in the scripture and, and we truly believe the entire Bible. All the Bible is for us, but not all the Bible is to us. As Paul wrote, as Paul wrote these verses, these are directed to members of the body of Christ where that's where we fit today. And so this letter ought to be sig significant to us. It ought to be ice cream. It ought to be ice cream. We ought to sit up and take notice. It ought to draw our attention. And so that, as Paul begins this letter to the Thessalonians, uh, I think he knew that the Thessalonians knew firsthand because of his present with them. I mean, he brought Christ to them for the very first time. He helped them set up that church in a very, very few weeks. In, in Acts chapter 17, we see that. And so as he wrote to them, I think it would be, uh, they would consider it, man, this is important. This is authoritative. This is God's word. In other words, God's word from God's man. You know, as you read the, uh, the Gospels, for instance, you know how the Jews esteemed Moses. Well, Paul is our Moses. Paul is our Moses today because we don't fit in the Jewish context. We fit in the body of Christ. He's, our, he's the one to whom we, we look to for finding truth 
that pertains particularly to us. And that will eliminate all sorts of confusion in the, in the Christian church today if the body of the whole church would do that. Paul also mentions here Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Sylvanus, the long word for, for Silas, but uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. On your uh, turn back to 1 Thessalonians briefly with me, and just notice in chapter 3 that Timothy, 1 Timothy, 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, that Timothy was, was uh, special to the Thessalonians because he was going back and forth. He spent more time there than Paul. And so Paul just naturally had to write, naturally had to emphasize Silas and Timothy in the context as well. Uh, picking up in verse 3, or verse 1, excuse me. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. Kind of put that in the back of your mind. Paul is in Athens uh, when he sends Timothy, verse 2. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer, etc. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but he sent Timothy. Paul was in Athens, sends Timothy back. Uh, skip down to verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also you. So in other words, in the course of events, Paul's, Paul was in Athens, sent Timothy, and I think in the meantime, while Timothy's over there at Thessalonica, Paul moves on to Corinth. Turn over to the book of Acts with me. Acts chapter 17. And so what happens is Paul was in Athens, decides, hey, Timothy's got to go over there, spend some time, get a report. Paul gets the report, and that urges him to write the very first letter. And then probably in a short time, I don't know how long, we can't tell, there was probably another exchange of visits, and Paul writes the second letter. I'm not going to read chapter 17, but in chapter 17, verses 1 to 10, we find... Paul's visit to Thessalonica, and what happens to him? He gets run out of town. Persecution comes. You know, if we stand for the gospel of the grace of God, you're going to get some flack. Second, second Timothy, Paul talks about persecution following those who desire to live godly. And if you stand, if you stand solid for the gospel of the grace of God, you don't attach a bunch of religious junk to it you're going to get some flack somewhere along the line. And uh, maybe if we're not getting flack, maybe we ought to examine, hmm, how come everything's so rosy for me? Anyway, we'll leave that be. But in, second, in, in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul uh, goes to Thessalonica and uh, he gets run out of town. And by the way, we're at point B on the outline if you're taking notes, point B on that outline. And uh, then as, as we move along, uh, and, and by the way, as Paul, as Paul writes this letter back to this, this church that he's, so, that he's so intimate with, I want to remind you of some of the things that he wrote back to them. I have them on the board there that he wrote back to them. He claimed to be, I'm like a gentle nursing mother with you. I, I, I long for you. You guys are glory and joy to me. That's just taking a few segments out of, out of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So Paul had this real close relationship with them. And so writing back to them, oh, you, can you imagine that first letter? Can you imagine how they were excited, as excited as a boy for ice cream, when Paul wrote back that first letter? Well, as Paul goes on, he's, he's run out of town. They saw Paul in trouble. And you, and you go on, what does he do? The next thing, he goes to a town named Berea. In, uh, in Acts chapter uh, 17, verses 11 to uh, 14 or so. And uh, in, in verse 13, what happens? Jews from Thessalonica came to town. What did they do? They jumped on his case again. Here they are harassing him, harassing him. Hey, did you know what this guy did over back in our hometown? And blah, blah, blah. He doesn't, he doesn't speak the truth. He's talking, you know. And here's God's man with God's message and the religious people run them out of town again. The religious people run them out of town. The Jewish religious people, again. It shouldn't surprise us if religious people, if pious people, if, if good people don't like to hear the gospel. It shouldn't surprise us. 
And then as, as, so Paul goes to Athens. Ah, verse 16. Actually, you see him going there in 15. In verse 16, now Paul waited for them at Athens. So Paul is alone at Athens like he wrote about while he waited for them in Athens. So here's Paul. He could have just relaxed along the seashore there. He could have just, just taken his time. He could have just whatever it is. But he got looking around. He got looking around and what happened? His spirit was gripped. His spirit was stirred with all that was going on, all the religious junk that was in Athens. It said there was a, an idol on every street corner. And Paul is just stirred and, and just, he just, he's so stirred that he can't shut up. You'd think a guy that got booted out of town in Thessalonica, booted out of town in Berea, you'd think a guy who'd had all that kind of trouble would kind of lay low. But no. In Athens, and, and I love what he does in Athens, he's talking to people in the marketplace, he's talking to people wherever he goes, he's just burdened, he's just stirred. He's just stirred that people don't know Christ. Does that ever bug you? Or do you kind of, hmm, oh well. You know, we ought to have a Pauline type attitude. We ought to catch what Paul's trying to say. That he's trying to focus in here and let us know that, that we, ought to, we ought to be stirred like him. But Paul gets stirred about this situation and um, he, he gets an audience. He finally gets a larger audience. Everybody wants to hear what this guy's got to say. And so I want to pause just briefly and just take a look at some of what Paul does in Athens. And I know I've read this numerous times, but every time it's encouragement to me. So pick up with me, would you please, in verse... Uh, well, let's pick up in verse 23 and just get the gist of it here. Uh, so Paul's just introducing himself. He says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship on every street corner, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. And who is this guy? Who is this small G-O-D? Well, in verse 24, Paul begins the exact same place that the Bible begins. God. God. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord, he's the master of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is, worship, is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives life, breath, and all things. Paul just sets the stage just like Genesis 1. He doesn't go into big elaborate art, art arguments about all the details and all, all the things that that sometimes we get distracted. He just starts out saying, hey, I got a message from him. He starts out from something they know, an idol, and he said, hey, I got the answer for this question mark. I got this answer for the question mark, and it is God. Well, who's God? He's the God who created. He's the God who created, and he's the God who needs nothing. In fact, one of the things I did is I looked through this, and, and I noticed that what Paul does is he, he goes through this and he begins with creation and he said, God's the creator. Where's our world on that today, by the way? Pretty far away, aren't they? That, that, that shouldn't shut us up. But he begins with God as a creator and then he goes all the way to the end. In verse 31 it is, he talks about God as the judge. You know, if God is the creator and God is the judge, then somewhere in between where we live, we are responsible to him. There's an accountability before God. And so what does Paul do in the mix of the whole thing? He shares the gospel. He shares the gospel with these people that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the penalty for sin, and all who trust him have eternal life. That's what he does. But as, I, as we go through this passage, let me just hit, hit some highlights what Paul uh, shares with them and, and when he's talking about God, he's defining who God is through this passage. That's just one way to look at this. In verses 24 to 26, he emphasizes creation. He's the creator. 
He is omnipotent. That means all powerful. Because why? Because he needs nothing from man. I mean, he's got to have dynamic power to create, but he needs nothing from man either. He's also eternal in verse 26 because he controls time and everything in it. Anyone who can control time, that's, that's God. He's eternal. He's also, though, in verse 26, he's also approachable. Verse 27, I think it is. Because he is merciful in verse 30. No, I don't see the exact word, but you see the sense. You see the character that God is merciful. And in verse 31, he's the supreme judge. He is the living, life-giving God. He kind of hints that he's life-giving at the, at the beginning of his message, and he wraps it up that he is also the life-giving God in verse 31. And then, of course, when he says, resurrection, some man was raised from the dead, you got to be crazy, and the whole crowd just blew up around him. But what did he do? He's talking about the death and the resurrection of the, the God-man, Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. He's sharing the gospel with them. It, yes, the resurrection itself might have might have uh, caused a blow up in their minds. But I think the focus, the focus, the real crux of the matter is the gospel. Paul shares the gospel with us, the gospel for today in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. He says that in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again. Yeah, Luke doesn't give us all the words that Paul says here. But we see the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the essential elements of the gospel. Christ's death and it was enough to pay the penalty for sin. It says that God is going to judge in righteousness. Well, if we stop and think about righteousness, if God is absolutely righteous, one of the things we know about us is that we are not, if we're honest with ourselves. We are not right in his sight. The only that way that the only way that we can obtain the righteousness that works in heaven is through him and from him. And so that's why Paul gives the gospel that Christ died for our sins. And that it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith, it's a matter of trusting Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins. We call that justification. Justification is simply that God, as a righteous judge, puts down the gavel and he says, you're right in my sight. I declare you right in my sight. Why? Because you're so good? No. Because Christ puts righteousness to your account the moment you believe him, the moment you trust him. Romans 5.1 talks about being having been justified by faith. It is not our works. It is not our religion. It is not anything but faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Some in Athens believed, if you peek at verse 34. Some actually believed. However, there were the, the bulk of them mocked or waited. And I know I've shared my outline of that before. And I've heard, I heard this years and years ago. The three, the three people, the three groups of people that were there, there were, that heard the message. There were the haters, the waiters, and the takers. The haters mocked. The, mater, the mayors kind of, more beans? <laughs> the, the, the waiters just kind of, oh, we'll wait it out. We'll see what happened, you know. In other words, let's put this off to another day. And then those that believed, those that trusted Jesus Christ, they were the ones who received it. If you're here today and you've been waiting, wait no longer. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee of life. So I urge you, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, to do so now. It's not a bunch of religious stuff. It's the victory that's found in Jesus Christ and Him alone who paid the full price. Turn with me to Acts chapter 18, and you're right there probably. Acts chapter 18. So what happens? I think my opinion is, notice I said my opinion. My opinion is Paul got run out of Athens too. I don't think it was very comfortable for him. Well, that's my opinion based on this and some other references. 
but I don't think Paul could stay in Athens. I don't think he waited there for, for uh, uh, Timothy and Silas to come any longer. I think when he started giving the gospel and there were those mocking and there was this hassle, I think he left. And we find in Acts uh, 18.1, he departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And we find him in Corinth. And when you pick up in verse 5, in verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, he had been busy sharing Christ in verse 4 in the synagogue with the Jews. He had been busy sharing Christ. But when Silas and Timothy finally came, and this is probably when we read in 1 Thessalonians 3, they came with this great report. Man, you should see what's happened in Thessalonica. You should hear what's going on with these people. I think it was this glowing report of what the Thessalonians were doing, how they were growing in their faith. He'd only been there four weeks, less than four, I think about four Sabbaths, as they say. He was only there three Sabbaths, I think it was, just maybe four weeks. And these guys had latched on to, they latched on to what Paul had said. They latched on to the gospel and they were, they were growing. And I think it just, I think it gave Paul just a charge. I think it gave him a charge and then he, he really started pouring it on in the synagogue, really started preaching and look what happens in verse 6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, having a fun day, another fun day at the synagogue. You know, preaching the gospel in the synagogue is sure easy going. They opposed, Paul said, all right, enough's enough. He shook his garments and he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And I want to just briefly make a statement here. This is a significant pronouncement upon the Jews. There are three of these recorded in the book of Acts. Acts 13, 46, Acts 8, 6, and Acts 28. I got a feeling there were more. But we have these three recorded in the history that Luke gives us. And I think they're here for the point to let us see that God was moving away from Israel as, as the chosen nation through whom he was going to bring about all things. He was moving away from that to saying, I'm going in another direction. I'm reaching out to Gentiles now. I'm bringing my message to Gentiles without the Jews even in the picture, so to speak. And this is significant. And in, 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 in through the book of Acts, by the time you get to Acts 28, 28, he says, the salvation of God has gone to the Gentiles. In other words, somewhere along the line between Acts 18 and Acts 28, if God had moved his program away from focusing on Israel, and he's now focusing on the body of Christ, the church. God now is dealing with all nations on an equal basis. In other words, if you have Jewish blood here today, Romans chapter 3 and verse 22 puts you in the same category as everyone else. It puts you in the same category. And you know what that category is? Verse 23 really clarifies it. It, it puts you in the category as a sinner, just like the rest of us. You can't go touting your Jewish braids or your Jewish clothes or your Jewish hat or hairdo or whatever and say, I am God's person. No. Today, you're only God's child by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's how you become a child of God. It is not through any kind of religion. So there, there's verbiage like in Romans 11.25 that says, Israel was blinded for a time. That blinding, blinding took place sometime before Acts 28, 28 to where God, and he says they're going to be blinded until the times of the Gentiles come in. The fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That's as long as they're blinded. And then God will resume all the promises he had with Israel. But in the meantime, you and I are here with the gospel of the grace of God that reaches out to everyone 
regardless of nationality, regardless of gender, regardless of social standing, the gospel is for all who trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And so I want to urge you to be sure that you are one of those. Well, that gives us an idea. And Paul, by the way, in Acts 18.11, I think it's verse 11, he was there for 18 months teaching the Word of God among the among these people. Why was he there so long? Why didn't he get right out of that town? Because God, in verses 9 and 10, gave him a promise that I got a lot of people in this city and you're not gonna, you're not gonna have to flee. I think that's even a hint that he had to flee earlier. Come on back to Thessalonians with me. Second Thessalonians, and let's kind of wrap up with the greeting that the Apostle Paul gave here. And so Paul establishes his his own authority. He writes this to this church. And, and then he has in verse 2, another grace and peace. But you know, how do you think these guys took it? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. How do you think they took it? Beans or ice cream? I think they'd have been on the edge of their seat. I think they'd have said, yeah, Paul is wishing us grace. He's wishing us grace and peace from God. It isn't just kind of some wording here. He's trying to share with us real truth, genuine truth about the grace of God and that, hey, we fit. We belong. We have peace because of God's grace. And there's much more that could be said. But it's, a, it's another grace and peace greeting just like chapter 1 and verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians. And then he has another thanksgiving in verse 3. Very similar wording to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1 where, where he talks about their faith, hope, and love. Interestingly, this one, he doesn't use the word hope. Now, some have jumped on that and said, how come he didn't use hope? Was it because they were confused like chapter 2 talks about? It could be. It could be. But I, th I see the, the word endurance in verse uh, 3 or, or 4, the word endurance or patience. I really see that as somewhat of a, somewhat of a hopeful idea. But anyway. And then notice in verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience or endurance and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. You know, if these guys were getting flack, if these guys were getting persecution, you know what it tells us? It tells us they were genuine. It tells us that they were, that they had something real. It's the mark of the reality of knowing Christ to getting flack. And Paul says, you know what? Not only do you guys got it, and I know you got it. I, I, just thinking that Paul would know about their troubles, I think that would encourage him. But he says, I even brag about you guys a little bit. I even brag about you guys a little bit that you, that you're genuine. You got genuine faith. You're hanging in there in the midst of difficult times. I think these genuine believers in this context would have received this letter like yum, yum. I think they would have received this letter the way you and I should. Because this letter is Scripture and God says all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Thess <coughs> Timothy 3. In this message today, I've given you doctrine. Is it yum yum to you or is it beans that Paul is the apostle of the dispensation of the grace of God? Is it yum yum or is it yuck yuck when it comes to who God is? You know? When it comes to Paul being stirred about the lost around him, man alive, that hits me like a reproof, like saying, man, how come you're not stirred like that? Or when it, comes to, when it comes to maybe some instruction in righteousness, the fact that I'm going to stand before God as the righteous judge one day. All of us are. That ought to be sobering. It ought to be sobering to us. Our risen Lord speaks to us in every scripture. How are you hearing it? How are you hearing it? 